we have kailash here uh, already joined in and uh, nupul is also here uh, so kailash if you would like to uh, begin i will hand it over uh, to nupul and uh, kailash yes good evening kailash hey good evening thanks yes, good evening kailash so uh, good evening everyone so uh, welcome to this uh, two year uh, the four talker sessions so we have kailash here with us he is the ctu at zeroda so he did his bs in computer science and phd from uh, middlesex university in artificial intelligence and computational linguistics and he has been working in in the tech sector as uh, advisor architect and a developer i still think he codes actively and you can see his github profile so he, he <laughs> actively codes daily on on a daily basis and and he's leading the whole tech team at at, at zeroda and for most of you uh, kailash we have around uh, 200 audience over here and and, and 500 there on on youtube live so um, around <coughs> so most of them are aspiring developers or um, trying to build a career in tech um, for those of you who don't know uh, zeroda currently handles 20% of all the trading that happens in india and one of the best thing about that is they do with a very small team and uh, kailash is going to explain like um, what 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 are the things that he put up in place so that they are able to manage that scale with very few members so kailash the basic question i think it might seem basic for uh, the, the people who are in tech so i just want to start off with uh the thing like what is foss and then how zeroda uses it uh to build the whole team and then the products around it okay, thanks uh, foss is free and open source software uh at zeroda we try to use open source self hosted software as much as possible for building end user applications and systems building back end systems building uh, running and hosting Uh, you know management systems communication systems everything whatever we can self host and self manage we do that uh it it i i have a as a hobbies developer i've always learned how to code by trial and error uh by picking up our freely available source code foss and that's how that's how i slowly became a developer you know uh, who did programming professionally so at zeroda you know when when we started the tech team there was just one person and naturally that person you know uh, brought their force experience and uh, force knowledge and started building a really small tech stack using foss uh, early days was fixing really small things you know digitizing bits and pieces in the within the organization not really building software to give out to users and it naturally grew from there so there's a strong uh, open source background here which became the foundation of uh, whatever we do at zeroda and thankfully it's worked out well for us so everything we do uh, it's all backed by open source software we also write and we also produce open source software you know contribute back however we can yes um that's about foss and zeroda so far the people who don't know so zeroda runs with only a tech team of 30 people so <laughs> that recently they, I, i came to know they added one more person so that's a small tech team com- uh, tech team compared to the scale at which they operate so i think they get millions of requests per um, on an hourly basis on on trades and all um, So Kailash how did you manage with uh, this this small amount of team building all the things without any enterprise software building everything based upon uh, the technologies or or the things that are available uh, in, in in the free world there was none of this was planned as i said we started out with zero and we started fixing small little things and it grew into a sl- small small Uh, you know slightly bigger project and a bigger project and another project and that it, it happened very organically so i think that trajectory of going from nothing with no specific plans to solving actual problems we had one by one contributed greatly into how this team slowly evolved i think it's a misconception uh, personally i don't really know 
uh, what sort of metric translates the number of developers into the complexity or the scale of the software that they are building. Uh, I don't think that the number of people really matter. There are some mind-blowingly sophisticated projects that are still built and maintained by in individual developers. You know, stuff, open source software that uh, pretty much the world runs on. So I don't, I don't think that sort of a metric really matters. Uh, how you structure the team, how you, how you, uh, the set of people who are working on a certain problem, their skill sets and how they interact with each other. I think these things contribute to how a small or large team can con uh, result in software running at a certain scale. So it happened very organically, like I said, we never had any agendas to you know create a big tech team or even you know start out by saying we need 10 front end developers or you know 15 back end developers when we felt that we needed more hands to build a project you know uh, you know we expanded the team by one person two person and that's why the team uh, it's really small like you said you know 31 of us and it's very personal we're all developers we develop and we write software build maintain and have fun every day. And that dynamic has just worked. And I, I don't think, you know, 30 people versus 60 people versus 100 people versus 15 people. I don't think it's possible to uh, quantify uh, the number of people working on you know, software like that. Yeah. So now that, that brings us to the next question. So you also contribute a lot to the open source stuff, like, like <coughs> even the projects which you took up and I think there are more open source projects which you contribute to than the number of people in your team. So how do you manage <laughs> like, uh, like doing both the stuff, like, like building as well as contributing to the open source? Contributing to open source, uh, it's not really, again, it's not really a personal agenda where I wake up and say, today I'll contribute to open source software. Like I said, I became a programmer by complete uh, accident happenstance and when when i happened to figure out what code was and what code could do and as i said i learned how to write code by looking at others code and others code that was freely available on the internet would have been free and open source software that people publish so it was only natural to me that i study and learn code by looking at other people's code you know changing modifying tweaking improving breaking it apart and whatever I did, whatever I was able to produce, I would put it out there uh, as free and open source software, just as I had learned. So that is very natural to me. And uh, it's just, I mean, programming is a hobby. When, uh, when you really like a certain hobby, you can get really productive in it. Of course, it's, we're talking about code. So the manifestation of the hobby time that is spent is software but could have been anything could have been gardening or you know cooking and you could have still been very productive if you really like what you're doing so i happen to like what i do i'm a hobbyist i really enjoy it uh, still so and that, that's why you know there are a lot of projects and i really like working on them yeah so now comes to the world of tech there are so many so many fancy things that come up so there's a lot of noise daily you wake up to like a new library or a new framework. Yeah. And you also have to take so many decisions on whether to pick up this or whether to, this is a noise or this is a very fancy thing. How do you make these decisions on which to pick up and which to pass away? I think that really requires experience for you to figure out what is really new or it just looks new or what is really an old concept that has been repackaged as new. You need to understand old. You really need to understand that. And I think... To understand that you have to have hands-on experience. If you haven't written code and produced software that people use and uh, you dabbled in all sorts of things hands-on, it's very difficult to make these decisions. There are, like you said, there are dozens of frameworks that get released every week and many of these look like the next big thing. So how do you uh, figure out the wheat from the chaff? You really have to understand the history of software and you have to have had experience writing code, understanding concepts, building useful, writing useful software to really 
to really see through these things and then decide. And these decisions are critical uh, because one decision today can uh, you know, completely change the timeline of your you know organization, business, etc. So more than about being right, these decisions come down to about being as less wrong as possible. And that you have to build up with experience by really writing software. Yeah. So, yes. So, and, and, and in this journey of, of writing software from uh, like, and then trying out new software, which, which are completely open source. So what are your uh, most important learnings from, from all this journey? I think personally, my biggest personal learning is that very few things are truly new. Uh, lots of these concepts, I mean, sometimes they are laughably old, but, you know, repackaged, renamed and, you know, uh, made all shiny today. So in most, all the serious stuff that we use to, let's say, build an organization, be it a financial business, let's say, I don't know, relational, relational databases or HTTP to, you know, uh, push your APIs over or a certain serialization language. Most of these are, are really, really old. All the technologies that we really use, all these concepts became solid decades ago. So we're just seeing, you know, slightly repackaged work portions of the same concept. So uh, over time, I personally realized that most new things aren't really new. They're just repackaged. And there is, it, rarely do you see truly breakthrough new technology or software that does something completely differently from how it was done earlier. Now coming to the the business you are in, which is in the finance side. So there you need to be much more stable, and there's you know much more compliance towards all the rules and regulations. And on the other side of the tech, as your startup you are growing, you need to be fast. You need to be experimenting. So how do you balance both of these things? It's very difficult to answer that. Uh, how do you make the right decisions? Is really the question. It's it's very difficult. I think it's a it's a lot of luck and luck. A factor uh, luck here is a function of uh, again the amount of experience you have uh, in writing software. Because, like like I said earlier, one tiny decision can change the complete change the trajectory of your entire organization. You know things can go horribly wrong. So you have to be especially working when working with really critical tech sorry, critical, in a critical domain like finance where everything is real time and you know, things can go wrong, you have to be very, very conservative. So building a startup or company fast does not mean shipping features fast. I think it's a very common misconception. Building can be all sorts of things. It could be future-proofing something that you anticipate, like a regulatory change. It could be uh, improving the underlying, underlying infra. It does not have to be, you know, things on the front end, you know, new features, entirely new features. So you really have to take in everything and, you know, apply some foresight and try to be as less wrong as possible. And honestly, again, that comes with hands-on uh, technical experience. Uh, those tiny, sorry, sorry those, those tiny, minute decisions that you take, they really are rooted in your uh, experience of having written software. Yes. Now, um, coming to the open source side of things, as as uh, a country, I mean, so we are not so much like like most of the companies are not so much open towards um, making their code public or or. But at Zerodha, you did you maintain that culture of making some of the things at least uh, public in putting them in public domain and also adopting to that. Um, so. How did this culture and then this can be like like um, brought across the whole country and many many startups? So what what is your uh, and then when they when these companies should start uh, doing those things? This is a this is an area where I have very uh, I have big gripes. I am always extremely disappointed by our you know tech industry uh, uh, by if you look at the consumption of FOSS, open source software, all our new, all the so-called unicorns that we know today, you know, all the high tech, you know, uh, companies and startups building really good consumer apps, all of them build everything on free and open source software, you know, pick up a really nice database, pick up a really nice framework, 
pick up a dozen frameworks, put everything together, you know, build your software and push it out there. And alongside that, build valuations, but never really talk about FOSS or acknowledge the importance of FOSS. That's a, I think it's a cultural problem because uh, it's not a matter of, you know, technical limitations or it's not a matter of uh, resources even because many of really big tech companies in India today are very well funded. It, it really comes down to uh, cultural, you know, uh, it, it's a cultural issue. I think uh, it can, I would, I would even, I would even say that uh, it all really begins with how our engineering curriculums are also structured. Uh, engineering students, when they come out, you know, uh, the, the kind of skills they are meant to have or the kind of exposure they should ideally get with free and open source software, because that's on day one, you're really writing JavaScript or Java or Python or whatever, and it's all open source to begin with. But there's no connection, there's no emotional connection with the concept of FOSS or uh, or the, be it the moment or be it the community aspect of FOSS. And that slowly permeates into the industry when, you know, when students come out of college. And pe students who end up, you know, young engineers who end up contributing, they do it out of their own volition. They would have discovered something on GitHub or Google and they would have, because they liked it, they would have become a part of it. But uh, like, a, like the academia gearing towards a force based industry doesn't exist here. And that again, like I said, permeates upwards into the industry. People, technical leaders of uh, many tech companies, they don't drive force initi initiatives. They don't really have a mandate to open source things. So it, it's, a, it's a complex issue, largely cultural. So then now, how did you convince your management team or, or your co-founders on I'm going to go in this direction so and, and i'm going to take up these decisions which which are completely different from what the industry is, is doing so there was no convincing so yeah. if we were to write do tech at zero it would only be in this way so one of the uh, really fortunate things about how we work at zero is that there's no tech versus management versus business there's no such divide there's no need to convince anyone. Everybody understands each other. You know, the dev teams are, uh, the tech team is empathetic towards business requirements and non-technical folks. And uh, the business folks are, uh, they, they're empathetic towards the tech teams. They understand each other. And it's always fruitful discourses. You know, we can have discussions, debates, things get shot down. But there's no need to go get approval because tech has to be done from a very technical perspective. As I said, this is one of the biggest pitfalls of many large enterprises, even really new startups, where there's a tech versus management divide and non-technical management tend to take highly technical and usually absurd decisions on what sort of technology stack should be you know, adopted, how the team should be grown. So fortunately, we don't have that. We try to do technology from a very technical perspective, from a very developer-centric view. So yeah, that's that's just how it's been. There's no convincing, you know, uh, there's no non-technical decision makers driving technical things at Zero. Okay. So now we, for all, all the audience out there, they're young and they have many different uh, like like ambitions. So there is always this choice when you are going to take uh, like to make between money, stack, culture, <laughs> and, and all the things. So there are a mix of you had to apply some algorithm to get a mix of all the things. So what is your suggestion and, and take to all, all these students on there? Uh, again, that's a very difficult question. I think, I, I think it, it's important to build some level of self-awareness first, because how do you figure out whether a stack is cool? Because most stacks are brand new. I mean, every two years, there's a completely new stack. Or how do you figure out what you really like to work on, especially for very young engineers who are just out of college, uh, they're very malleable, right? They may not really know what they would end up enjoying. Some people may like data, some people may like building front end, some people may like doing all of it. I think my personal view here is that if you want to be able to make better decisions when it comes to matters of career, it's very important to have 
hands-on experience writing software. It again comes back to hobby projects. If you if you work on hobby projects, and when I say hobby pro- projects, I don't really mean you know stuff that you write and throw away. Most of it may be throw away, but there are certain things that just spin off and turn into really useful tools. Right? They can uh, take they can take a life of their own. Now, if you if you write software hands-on, build useful things as your hobby, and you push it out there, you interact with users, you you gain that. Uh, you gain very important insights and perspectives, which can really, really help you make better career decisions. Otherwise, you know, you learn how to write code. You're out there. You're looking for a job. How do you even? Where is even that data to make an informed decision with so many, you know, different variables? So, I would just say that build hands-on experience by writing software as a hobby if you like programming, and a lot of things will naturally become clearer, uh, even matters of, uh, especially matters of career. Yeah. Okay. Now, doing this hands-on experience again, changing the tech and all, so requires a kind of learning on your own or, or by something. So how do, how do the, you catch up or your team catch up with the new things and what is your suggestion for all the people who are planning to learn new things in a very quick fashion? I think you can really only learn programming by being hands-on. I mean, you can read all about it, but you will not be able to write uh, useful software. You have to write code. You have to run into bugs, issues. You have to give it out to users. You have to understand the perspective. So even if you go learn it, for you to truly build that experience as a developer, you have to write software. You have to write actual software that people use or solve problems. How do you do it? I mean, it, it... it varies from person to person. Uh, for me personally, it's a hobby. So whenever I find personal time, actually all, all of my personal time is largely spent on, you know, trying to uh, work on my personal projects or try to do, uh, learn something new. And for many people in our tech team, uh, we're all very alike when it comes to this. We really like what we do. And many of us, we keep on building, you know, little projects. And when you have... A work environment like that, uh, it's possible to spin off things that you're doing for work into something useful that you can push out also. So, you know, it's all of those factors work together. So sometimes work kind of becomes hobby and the lines blur. So really, you just have to experiment. Firstly, you have to like it. You can't force really yourself to like it. You have to like writing code. And then these things become easy, you know, hobby projects, Improving yourself, you know, learning, collaborating, those things become natural. So now the next question is like, how did you achieve the scale? Because scaling is one of the most toughest things to do in tech. And you are have to rewrite, you have to rework upon a lot of things for the scale. And at finance, you should not break down because each one it should not have any zero, you have zero tolerance for error. So how did you achieve this zero? Uh, many factors are You have to have, like I said, less wrong technical decisions. And there are countless technical decisions that have have to be taken over the years. So the less wrong you are, the better your odds at being future-proof with your software, being ready for scale. Otherwise, you end up with technical debt and no amount of money or resources can fix a really bad uh, debt-laden tech stack. So firstly... Super early decisions, they're always technical, always dev-centric uh, and careful. Those decisions go a long way. Uh, decisions that we took in 2014 have enabled us to, you know, tiny technical decisions on what sort of a, an in-memory cache to use or, you know, how to structure a certain system or API. They've helped us scale heavily in 2021, where today we are running at 1,000x of what we were running in, you know, uh, five, six years ago. So those uh, engineering decisions from a purely technical perspective are extremely important. And our use of FOSS, you know, open source software, it's helped us greatly. We are not locked into or tied into many things where uh, as you as you grow, as your stack grows, organization grows, you really need to, you're in a position where you really have to replace several things. 
several critical systems but if you are let's say vendor locked in or tied into certain tied into certain proprietary software you you really don't have the liberty to experiment or plug out plug it thankfully our conscious choice of self hosted that's also important self hosted fos components that we glued together helped us you know scale things independently you know take out one piece replace it without anything else knowing so basically you know architecting and we are not afraid to rewrite things uh, when we feel that something you know a certain component or whatever is becoming slow or is becoming bottleneck we are not afraid to pause new features for weeks or even months and rewrite the entire thing so uh, there's this one component that i always think of uh, on on your trading platform there are numbers stock prices that tick live and that component the ticker we rewritten it i think five times from scratch delete the whole entire you know back end technology the protocol delete everything rewrite it and but that's never affected anything else we've been able to independently you know replace and rewrite that every time we ran into a bottleneck and similarly we also uh scrapped entire back end systems that not technical people use you know there are tons of uh depart sorry there are several departments in legal compliance support etc and they all of them have to log into systems to manage do their you know daily stuff so all the management dashboards etc again we built it on on top of erp next which is again an amazing you know open source project and because it was self hosted because because it was fast because we had the liberty to change it however we want we've been always we've always been able to remove fix swap out so a culmination of all of this together has helped us uh, achieve scale and it really happened abruptly uh, last year when you know everything became 5x overnight uh, so that uh, and as i said pausing to pausing new features and acknowledging technical debt and deleting and rewriting that's a very difficult decision and in many organizations where non technical leadership uh make the call about technical things that can never happen because generally what from what i've seen is that people say if it's working don't touch it don't change it so you can give them a technical uh reason saying this is slowing down by 50 milliseconds every month but they wouldn't care and you let it go for a year suddenly you have technical debt that can never be replaced so we don't operate like that we look at all our systems internally and externally for, with a very developer centric engineering centric perspective and a culmination of all of these things have helped us yeah so this is tech i mean so what is the current zero that tech stack looks like so that audience if they want to Uh, understand and like get a like like over your walk how you are what is the current text we we use go heavily for many user facing apps uh, for uh, a lot of high throughput apps and services we use go uh, we use python also heavily for a lot of uh, back end data crunching and processing end of the day in the in the stock market in the capital markets industry A lot of data is crunched at the end of the day. You synchronize with exchanges, all these large institutions. There's a lot of batch processing, tons of number crunching. A lot of that uh, for a lot of those things we use Python, and uh, we use Postgres heavily to store hundreds of billions of rows of financial data. We use Redis heavily for uh, high throughput responses to uh, re- responses for high throughput. sorry uh, to serve responses for high throughput apis these are the four major components you know go python postgres redis then of course there are lots of bits and pieces we use kafka as a message bus in places we use nats for streaming a mobile apps are all written in flutter now and uh, our web apps are written in vue js so it's it's yeah it's a mix and match of several things our Uh, entire organizational infrastructure management dashboard accounting ledgers you know people logging in and looking at data permission control intranet leave hr all those things are built uh, on top of erp next and frappe so that's also a really big building block of organizational building block for us so yeah that's that's what a stack looks like now so um how do you see this evolving the the 
source and open source uh, playing a major part in in the next 5 to 10 years in, in the organizations growth i mean not only us but everybody who is building in india so. i think we are past that point everybody builds fast i mean i can't really think of a single uh, you know famous known you know, new age startup or tech company that isn't largely built on fast in programming languages of fast javascript libraries are fast web servers are fast everything is fast so uh, that that we are we are beyond we are way past that point globally i think the question now is when will india the indian industry tech industry start acknowledging fast and contributing it back because it's not just about it's not just a symbolic gesture if you want a strong tech ecosystem you need uh, projects to come out of india open source projects you need communities to be built around that you need large developer pools to actively participate and contribute to these projects otherwise the industry is just you know bunch of startups engineering colleges you know people moving from you know company to company there's no community and without community it's you don't really have without community and collaboration uh, on a really large scale uh, you can't really have a strong technical back backbone especially at at a, a national level so it it really have to uh, institutions really have to acknowledge this force acknowledge the consumption of force and encourage their developers to uh, contribute you know release open source software let a thriving tech community be built here which will also of course build expertise so now we have uh, like like lot of uh, young folks over here how can they start their contribution towards the cause because most of the times they face this initial starting once once you are into it you can you can go about knowing all things so how do they start their journey on on contributing to this there are there are two sides to it if you really just want to contribute to force as in your goal is to contribute to force there are countless force projects that need help and maintenance it could be fixing it could be as simple as writing documentation for a technical project which is and developers don't write don't like writing documentation so that's an easy low hanging fruit you pick projects that you use or you like you can start by contributing documentation wherever you learn about the pro- project to begin with or you could even contribute graphics or you can contribute code so for that you have to identify projects that you like now if you just you know go on github and say let me find a project that i might like that i want to contribute to it's going to be really difficult so the most natural way is to we use software every day for everything identify software that we like because we use them and they solve a certain problem for us and those kind those uh those kind of technologies and software you can relate to and connect uh, uh at an emotional level and it will be much easier to contribute so you have to I, i don't think you should look at it from a top down perspective as in i want to be involved in force let me try and find something you should it should be bottom up let me look at the software that i use and i like and let me try and contribute uh to these to one of these things and then once you start a contribution once you get involved then it can just snowball and you know your contributions can go bigger and bigger that's one thing the other thing is if you like programming try and write programs that solve actual problems could be really simple things right and contribution does not mean contributing to large existing fast projects it could be building you know like a like tiny little tools and open sourcing your own code so there are two ways of doing this if you like programming if you have problems could be simple automation could be anything write a decent program around it and you know open source it and you might end up building a community around that so i would say yeah, either of these approaches yeah and also most of these um, people are or hearing a lot of buzzwords like ai ml data science cryptography yeah. and, and and then like like a lot of things happening and like uh, what what is your take and what's your suggestion on this this so so tech hype and tech fads and hype cycles have existed forever that's why uh, as i said earlier i think it's very important to understand software history to a certain extent you have to go back you know 20 30 years to see how software has evolved and once you see that 
see and understand that history uh you will see that a lot of these, these things are just you know uh repackaged hype and it will help you identify a tech hype cycle and maybe dodge it so ai ml of course there's a huge ai ml boom there's ai ml everywhere does not mean that just because it's hot i would like to pick it up and do something with it that is like uh trying to find uh a problem sorry try, that's like having it's the classic uh nail and hammer scenario you have a hammer which is called ai ml and now you're constantly looking for some random nail to hammer on or some random problem to solve here also i think it should be a uh, bottom up if you encounter a real problem that you can solve with software by writing code then you might end up picking ai for it if it's the right tool for the job or you might pick something else so it, it it wouldn't really matter so rather than just saying i know react native is really nice i'm just going to pick that up and do something in it you'd rather look for actual problems to solve and then figure out if react native or ai ml or whatever it is fits this fits this particular task that's that would be so the odds of being successful you know building something useful and learning something useful are much higher when you look at it uh, Uh, when you don't look at it top down and start from that problem that you know some fundamental problem to solve um yes kala show we start taking some more the questions from the audience so a lot of questions coming around so there is sure. uh, some one from discord is asking what advantages does indian tech market have than other countries don't uh again difficult to quantify but i would say right now there's a big tech boom in india so there are a lot of opportunities in uh, very technical roles and there is huge amounts of funding coming in uh, creating a thriving industry so i would say i would say that that the tech boom the industry boom is an advantage that uh, india as a market has right now there could be others but this is something i mean this seems obvious to me yeah okay Yeah, there's someone who read your blog and asked this question. You mentioned in one of your blogs that developers should dabble in everything: front end, back end, testing, QC, infrastructure, DevOps, yeah. and will focus gradually and naturally. Do you suggest the same for the beginner level developers as well? No, oh, absolutely. Uh, again, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times already. Unless you dabble in a lot of things, how could you possibly know what suits you better? Imagine you only uh, are working with in an you start out as a young engineer or a programmer by narrowing your scope on one tiny thing you may or may not like it but there could be 100 other things that you really like and excel at and without experimenting how could you possibly know now again the best way to experiment with lots of things is to write useful software find a problem and try to write some code to solve it that writing that code may involve building a backend it could involve building a command line interface or a ui or whatever so when you when you try to write self contained software you you'll automatically end up dabbling in everything rather than saying how do i start with back end how do i start with front end etc so write hobby projects self contained hobby projects that are useful to others i think you'll end up dabbling in everything and then eventually figure out there are a lot of questions coming around the decentralized cryptocurrency and I'll just combine all of them the zero run they're going into decentralized finance industry or what is your views on cryptocurrency that zero the users blockchain so again i mean all of them blockchain is an interesting technology i think it's extremely overhyped cryptocurrency is one use case of blockchain but uh, a lot of the problems that are being uh, a lot of the problems that are being identified in the industry at least in india right now to be solved with blockchains can be solved with many other technologies in much easier and simpler ways so i think you should be very cautious about uh cautious when looking at blockchains as a technology it's a piece of technology like any other there are all sorts of uh also there are many different kinds of ledgers there are many ways of distributing systems and consensus and ledgers so there's that at zeroda we don't use a blockchain because we've never seen a problem that requires a blockchain as a solution we also barely use any sort of ai ml models because we am really come across any problems that really need those so again the classic nail hammer thing if we end up seeing 
a problem that requires a certain ml model or if it really requires blockchain we might consider it for us the, the approach is again bottoms up you find the right tool to solve the real problem that you have rather than you know picking up a really cool tool and looking for problems to shoehorn into that also zeroda does not do any cryptocurrency because we are in an extremely heavily regulated industry and there are no uh, cryptocurrency regulations in india so uh, we are heavily heavily regulated by half a dozen uh, institutions and entities so you can't legally another question related to non coding what is the other thing you like to do other than coding see i'm thinking which means <laughs> i i i i know i like planting vegetables okay. i like i mean stuff that everybody likes watching a nice movie or uh, reading or reading history i really like reading history or experimenting you know making little things with uh, you know tinkering so uh, yeah just uh, yeah i can't really think of anything that i truly love apart from this i like many other things but i guess writing code is what i really really like as a hobby yeah again one more question on youtube about your open source if it's open source is it safe safe especially for financial dealings i think the question uh, itself is incorrect that's like saying is if it's software is it safe or if it's code is it safe uh, these things are mutually exclusive you can have extremely safe open source software extremely unsafe open source software or extremely safe proprietary software or extremely unsafe proprietary software it all comes down to the quality of uh, the engineering decisions and the quality of code that have gone into a particular piece of technology that said open source software is likely to be likely to have better security because by definition it's out there in the open people can see it and if it's if there's an active community around open source software the odds of people discovering issues and bugs and contributing fixes are much higher than let's say close a proprietary software which is only accessible to a really small group of people so the more eyes you have on the code the better the odds of people spotting issues so i would say open source software is safer uh, i i don't really have metric but you know just anecdotally that the likelihood of open source software being safer uh, in terms of technical security is much higher compared to closed source applications so a lot of questions coming around joining your team so what are <laughs> what do you look in as like candidate before hiring them in your team uh we don't really look at educational qualifications we look at people uh we look at attitude we look at their hobby projects uh we don't even look at industry experience that doesn't really matter industry experience doesn't matter but actual hands on uh coding experience does matter so we look at the hobby projects that people have done the kind of effort and love they poured into the software they write and they've written and their attitude their attitude towards writing you know software and their attitude towards uh being in a tech team so we are a very flat organization uh everyone is a full stack developer everybody does everything if something needs doing whoever is available they'll do it there's no you do that and i will not touch that we don't have that sort of a thing we don't really have a hierarchy at all so that that attitude is important and i think one really important factor is that uh, there's again a misconception that you know certain companies only write cool software and you know there's always constant innovation happening there's always cutting edge technology being written that's not really true uh, sometimes there's a lot of innovation and once you innovate and create software then it's your burden for life to maintain and patch and fix and improve so 90% of software is really boring maintenance work no matter where you are no matter what company you are 10% is spurts of innovation and this balance finding the right balance between these two can keep you going as a developer so we look for that acceptance you know the understanding of this fact that not all software is cool and you have to do a lot of boring work realistically uh in people so that's a part of attitude so, yeah yeah another interesting question do you have pressure when you have more competition in your fintech field 
especially for all uh, uprising fintech companies during corona times and indians are looking investing into the lot of this and the numbers are rising i would i mean nitin would be nitin is the ceo of zeroda uh, he would be the right person to uh, answer this my perspective is slightly different uh, we are here the tech team is here to do good work have fun and build good software good financial software and make it accessible to as many people as possible and continuously improve it honestly if somebody if competition is building software uh, better we we may look at that and improve our you know, if we see flaws in our software we'll improve it but are we is the tech team i'm only speaking uh, uh, on behalf of the tech team and myself it doesn't really matter we are just in it because you know we like writing software and it's solving real world problems it has helped spawn a sustainable profitable business as long as these boxes are ticked competition is great i mean we need better software better competition you know better incentives to continuously improve your own technology we don't advertise or market we don't burn crazy amounts of money actually we don't burn any money on advertising so our advertising in itself is the quality of software that we write so when competition spends a lot of money on ads or marketing campaigns we don't even know how we don't even know how to gauge that because our metric is quality of products so yeah that's the, that's the view we have again one more controversial question do you think indian tech landscape is derivative of western apps why don't we have many ground working concepts again that's a bit controversial uh i think i don't think we should look at it like that really because throughout history right lots of things have been invented in lots of places simultaneously a few things have been invented in certain places and then adopted by the rest of the world and improved considerably so if you look at humanity as a whole globally i don't think it's right to say that oh, this country's software is entirely uh, based on this other country's software it may be true and i hope if it's true it, it's temporary uh it's not necessarily bad it's it's innovation is always incremental right we are not inventing new things every day we're literally picking up you know things that already exist and improving them adding value to them in many different ways we you know software businesses a better tool to i don't know manage your files is a better file manager but we don't look at it we don't say that oh the file manager was invented in this country so we created a better file manager it's a copy i don't think it's uh, we should even look at it like that but the other aspect is that why is there no why is there a visible lack of original seemingly original software coming out of india i think it again comes back to the uh, whole discussion about open source software if we have we need to build a thriving open source community here in india we need our developers to build projects improve projects and attract other developers to work on these projects so that we can have you know we we can have our own thriving tech capacity we have that capacity it's all siloed inside the industry there's no community really so i think once we do that we will start seeing once we have that ecosystem working i think we'll start seeing a lot of software originate here and that's not to say that we need to constantly originate completely new software here. it's not possible we need to build whatever is useful you know things that solve problems so uh, that that whole feeling looming feel sensation and feeling that india may just be always india is always being inspired by you know technology and apps in the west to overcome that we should build our own you know force ecosystem let everybody take out software that originates here collaborate just like we take open source software built everywhere uh, across the world and build stuff here so that's the answer uh, to the no, first of said i mean do do you have that vision of, of starting this this whole community and i know zero da also uh, invest in a lot of companies and also like put a lot of efforts in in building this thing so so what is your plans on on, on expanding this ecosystem to a much higher or broader level i think it's so we have this you know some of us have gotten together to start this non-profit organization called force united it uh, aims at, it 
its whole goal is to kick start and fund good fos projects originating in india to encourage to build a community of you know fos developers now that's just an attempt it would be delusional to say that you know we have this grand vision of transforming the indian tech landscape that's not possible but if we can create a small little bubble that's that in itself you know uh, is a very uh, that's a valuable step so we do that we have a community called fos united and we're doing some very interesting things uh, you know giving out grants uh, you know, no strings attached cash grants to fos projects originating in india uh, you know building a community you know, sharing our projects so there's that uh, you can check it out fos united yeah so a couple of questions before we wind up so what is the biggest technological problem you faced and how did you overcome so again from youtube this I think the biggest technological problem that we face today is, I think, the same biggest technological problem that you know people faced 30, 40 years ago. It's how to, it's how to scale your database. It really, uh, you can database technology has advanced like nobody's business, but so has data. So your application is this, is this meme that we invented that 97.45 percent of all issues are database issues. i think that's largely true uh, you know and slightly uh, uh, from a high sorry slightly humorous perspective so most of our issues are really the same classic issues how do you scale the number of connections tcp connections when there's a lot of traffic concurrency so concurrency is a pain uh, scaling databases is a pain and i think if you solve concurrency and databases a lot of scaling issues that an average business would face will be solved so yeah just problems that everybody faces that these are the same problems that we also face yeah the final question before we end up so in zero la there are a lot of legal entities that you have to take care so how do developers keep all these things in mind when they are working on software to the compliance part and all how do how do developers deal with it it's a very collaborative effort we have a great compliance team at zeroda you know people who have really good deep uh, domain knowledge of compliance and when i say compliance every day there are probably several circulars that come from several institutions you know changing laws changing regulations slightly so unless you have deep domain expertise in those things and you're constantly keeping track of track of the regulatory landscape it's impossible so we have a very as i said there's no tech versus management versus you know we don't have that divide so whenever we're building a feature or changing something or something has to be changed you know the right teams get together discuss collaborate and get it done so the compliance team if they identify an issue or some a change they'll you know come speak to us we'll have a fruitful discussion and make the change that is necessary and vice versa so it's a very collaborative effort with uh, between the developers and other teams Uh, of people with deep domain knowledge of finance and regulations yeah uh, i think thanks kela it's, it's been wonderful spending the saturday evening with us with our students giving them yeah. all the insights and and uh, i hope they are able to learn a lot more things uh, from you and and in the way in which you the model in which you operate and in the way in which you are building the culture there at zero over yeah. to you prateek thank you thank you thank you thanks Thanks Kailash uh, for the wonderful session uh, it was very very insightful and uh, uh, and, and the questions that uh, the students were asking were also like shows the curiosity that they have uh, towards the work that you guys are doing it is uh, amazing and uh, thank you so much for taking out time today on saturday evening and interacting with our kids sure thank you thanks very much thank you bye